All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and our continuation of our fifth BCBA practice exam. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. As always, when you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. A student in Cindy's class loves to ask several questions in a row when Cindy is attending to other students. The student will not complete work until his questions are answered. This behavior typically occurs twice every one hour class. What might Cindy do first in an effort to reduce question asking? So we are looking at what? Well, we're looking at Cindy impossible interventions to reduce question asking. So why is question asking occurring or why is she targeting this? Well, there's a student who asked several questions in a row when Cindy is attending to other students, and the student will not complete work until his questions are answered. It looks like the questions are being asked for attention. Cindy is attending to other students, and he asked questions, several questions in a row when she's attending to other students. So we can hypothesize this is potentially an attention-seeking behavior because once questions are answered and he's given attention, the student will complete the work. So this behavior typically occurs twice every one hour class. And that's important because when we talk about what Cindy might do in an effort to reduce question asking, we can think along the lines of maybe something like non-contingent reinforcement. With non-contingent reinforcement, we can reduce the motivation to ask all these questions and seek attention. We can use non-contingent reinforcement as a sort of abolishing operation. So let's look at our answer choices. A, provide the student with attention every 35 minutes non-contingently. So when you are setting up a non-contingent reinforcement system, what you want to be sure and do is exactly what, what we've done here. We're trying to figure out how often this behavior occurs. So twice every one hour class, every 30 minutes. Your non-contingent reinforcement should be less than how frequently the behavior occurs. So if this is happening every 30 minutes, our non-contingent reinforcement must occur before 30 minutes. The entire idea is to reduce motivation for that behavior to occur at all. So if we can introduce non-contingent reinforcement every 25 minutes, that might reduce or abolish the motivation to ask these questions. And that's the entire idea between, behind non-contingent reinforcement. C, put the question asking behavior on extinction using planned ignoring. Well, we're not going to do that because if we do that, the student will not complete the work and we need him to complete his work. And then D, implement a negative practice overcorrection strategy and have the student ask questions over and over during recess. So we're talking about what she'll do first, and we're never going to try punishment first, especially for a mildly, a mild behavior like this one. We're never going to jump right to punishment. What Cindy might try in order to avoid him not doing his work and avoid punishment is some non-contingent reinforcement every 25 minutes. Turk's parents are separated. Turk spends half the week with his mom and half the week with his dad. Turk's dad starts putting Turk's crying on extinction and successfully reduces his crying behavior. What should Turk's dad do next? All right. Turk's dad has successfully implemented this intervention. This is great, right? He's put the crying on extinction and he reduced... That shouldn't be there. Reduced the crying behavior. So what should Turk's dad do next? And when you think about this question, you always want to, for every question, really consider all the information given. What do we know? Well, we know he spends half the week with his mom and half with his dad. So if his dad has successfully implemented the intervention, what is his mom doing? And if we don't share the information with mom, what might happen? So what should Turk's dad do next? A, infirm Turk's school of the new behavior plan as needed. Sure, right? We want our behavior plans to be as consistent as possible across all environment. And why? Well, because of behavior contrast. If we're changing things in one environment, behavior tends to go the opposite way in other environments if the same changes aren't made. So if we put this behavior on extinction in Turk's dad's home, there's a good chance that when we go to mom's home, that behavior would have increased since it's decreased in Turk's dad. Same with school. So A, sure. What about B? Meet with Turk's mother to discuss the changes. Same thing. We want to be as consistent as possible. And that's what's going to make you a better analyst. 
when you implement something that's effective, don't stop there. Make sure all the major environments are consistent. C, prepare a punishment procedure for when spontaneous recovery occurs. That's not really relevant. We're not going to punish when spontaneous recovery occurs. We just continue with extinction. What we want to do is inform all the major environments and stakeholders of the changes so we can have consistency. That might mean the school, could mean the mother. So what should he do next? Both A and B. Garrett has a Thomas to Tank engine token board that is used during discrete trial teaching. Garrett must earn five tokens for break. Garrett always starts with a sixth token that can be redeemed for an extra minute, but can also be taken away contingent on behavior. What type of procedure is this? Okay, let's break this down. If you've been studying a while, you, you might have predicted the answer already, which is great. You should be working to predict answers as you read the prompt, okay? We know that Garrett has a token board for DTT. He gets five tokens for break. We also know he starts with a sixth token, but that token be take, can, take, can be taken away contingent on behavior. So when we have a situation where we take away reinforcement based on behavior, what is that called? Well, it's a response cost procedure. And when we take away an added reinforcer or an added stimuli like this stimulus, like this token, what do we call that more specifically? A, hero response cost. Not a hero response cost, right? Don't get this confused with any group contingencies, the hero procedure. B, star response cost. That might sound good, but it's not what it's called. It's called a bonus response cost. We have this bonus token that can be taken away through a response cost procedure. And then a mediated response cost also might sound good, but we are looking for bonus response cost. And this is why fluency is so important because on the exam, you'll get questions like this where you know, star response cost sounds kind of good. Mediated sounds good. Hero sounds good. If you don't really know, all four of those kind of seem like they might fit. Fluency is the key. You Fluency must come before anything else. When I'm tutoring and helping people out, I always say don't even try questions until you're fluent because you're just going to be doing a disservice to yourself. Remember, errors lead to more errors. Get as fluent as possible and then start attacking questions. 84, you overhear two behavior technicians talking. One technician tells the other that the purpose of a force choice preference assessment is to identify reinforcers for the client to use during DTT. What is wrong with this statement? All right, let's read through this again. Sometimes even I read the question, right? And I've got to go through it again. We should always do all our work up front. You've got to understand everything in the question before going to the answer choices. So we're talking about this statement. What statement? Well. One technician told another technician that a force choice preference assessment identifies reinforcers. What's wrong with that? That doesn't seem right. And we apologize for the change in font. That'll be fixed on the final product. But regardless, we are looking at what is wrong with this statement. Now, immediately what comes to your mind? Well, do preference assessments identify reinforcers? No. What do they identify? Potential reinforcers, right? So A, only single choice assessments identify reinforcers. No preference assessments identify reinforcers, right? They identify potential reinforcers. Force choice assessments don't identify reinforcers. Yes, that's what we're looking for, okay? We're looking for preferences and potential, not actual reinforcers. Not until a reinforcer assessment can we determine that. C, the identify reinforcer can't be used during DTT. Reinforcers are always used during DTT, but we're not identifying a reinforcer. That's the issue here. So, and indeed, nothing is wrong with the statement. No, the problem is the force choice assessment does not identify a reinforcer. Only a reinforcer assessment identifies reinforcers. Preference assessments identify preferences and potential reinforcers. Very important distinction. 85, when a concurrent schedule is in effect, responses in a response class will occur when? So what is a concurrent schedule? Two schedules are running simultaneously for multiple behaviors. It's associated with matching law and choice. So essentially the question is asking, what does matching law say about responses in a response class? A, independent of the concurrent schedule. So do responses in a response class occur independent of the concurrent schedule? 
Well, of course not, right? Because those schedules are, are, are mediating and maintaining and evoking these responses, right? So, of course, they don't operate independent of the schedule. What about B, proportionate to the type of SD that is given? Well, it's not proportionate to the SD, not the antecedents. The responses in a response class are proportionate to the consequences, right? If you get reinforced every five responses on schedule one, and then every two responses on schedule two, your responses will proportionate to that amount of reinforcement. So you might respond almost, well, more than double to schedule two when you're getting reinforced every two responses, rather than schedule one where you're getting reinforced every five. So when a concurrent schedule or matching law is in effect, responses in a response class occur proportionate to the value of the consequences. 86, Taylor Swift, during her recent performance in Las Vegas, told the crowd to sing along with her and then started singing the song Blank Space to watch the crowd started singing every word with Taylor. The crowd engaged in what? Okay, pretty straightforward question. But don't get these confused, right? When we talk about listener behavior, imitation, and modeling, and remember, listener behavior is kind of the more modern way to say receptive instructions, right? Same idea. Listener behavior, imitation, and modeling are three very distinct things. you got to remember that pure imitation is evoked by a nonverbal SD. Listener behavior is clearly not. So that's a key. And then modeling, right, is when the teacher or the model shows a a learner and the learner imitates, right? Imitation and modeling are linked. Listener behavior is, is kind of its own thing. In this case, Taylor Swift did what? Well, she told the crowd, sing along. She gave them uh, the receptive instruction, right? This is a receptive instruction, essentially. Start singing, and the crowd started singing every word with Taylor. What did the crowd engage in? Well, since their behavior was evoked by a verbal SD, the hey, sing along with me, or everybody sing along, not imitation. It's listener behavior. That's the key difference. Pure imitation is when a nonverbal SD, like a model, evokes the behavior. Had Taylor just started singing and not said anything, that would be imitation. But she didn't. She said, sing along with me. The crowd did. They engaged in listener behavior. Joanna is teaching a new employee the proper way to arrange a dining room table for a dinner party. Joanna walks through the perfect placement of decorations step by step. Joanna then shows the employee pictures of a failed dining room table setups at the end of training. What is Joanna doing at the end of training? We're focused on what? We're focused on end of training. We know she's training a new employee. She's teaching a new employee. Walks through all these decorations. She then, at the end of training, shows the employee pictures of failed dining room table setups. She wants her to do what? She wants it arranged perfectly. Why would she show failed dining room table setups? A, she's establishing a threat. Nothing indicates Joanna gave any sort of threat to the employee. This can't be construed as a threat without more information. B, using an example. Now be careful. Is this an example or a non-example? Well, in ABA terms, it's a non-example. We should always try to write non-examples in for our behavior definitions, especially. Aggression is, aggression isn't. That's what Joanna's doing. She says, this is the perfect placement. Let me show you non-examples of perfect placement. Implementing errorless learning. No, just the pictures aren't enough to prevent errors. The person can still make errors. So Joanna has shown her pictures of what not to do. She's shown her non-examples. A behavior analyst shows up to a parent meeting excited to share the result of last month's man training procedure. Based on the data, the client has made tremendous gains. When the analyst sits down with the parents, he explains the progress. However, the parents inform the analyst they are not happy with the intervention and would like it changed. How should the analyst proceed? Tricky situation. Stakeholders have to be involved with treatment planning. They have a say. And the, the question always becomes, well, at what point do I get final say? And the answer is you always get final say. You're you're responsible, okay? In the new ethical code, if if they the stipulates that if if you can't essentially come to an agreement with the parents and they don't work hard and they don't work with you, it's just not going to work. You can terminate, okay? 
Now, we want to have an amicable, friendly relationship, a good working relationship. But at the end of the day, it's your responsibility. You get final say. With that said, we go to the parent meeting. We have the results of last month's training procedure. The client made tremendous gains based on data. And what do we trust? We trust data. We don't trust anecdotes. We don't trust, oh, I've seen a lot of progress. Or I haven't seen any progress. We trust data. Data, meaning you have to trust your technicians who are taking that data. Now, analyst sits down, explains to the parents. They say, we're not happy with it. We want it changed. What do you do? A, honor the parent's request and change the intervention. Well, hold up. It's just, your data says tremendous gains have been made. Let's not jump to conclusions here. B, present the data to the parents and explain that it is not possible to change the intervention. Well, that's too far the other way. Maybe they are right. Maybe your data is wrong. We don't know yet right? What about C? Present the data to the parents and ask why they are unhappy with the intervention. That's a good place to start. Here's the data. It shows we have gains. Why aren't you happy? Let them explain to you. Maybe they have a reason. Maybe they don't. Maybe you can work through it. We don't just jump from one to the next, right? No, we can't change it at all or immediately change. Let's talk it out. It's part of your, big part of your job. And then D, inform the parents that the technician must have made a mistake with the data and apologize. Don't throw your technicians under the bus. They've got to be there every day. They've got to work with these parents directly. Look out for your technicians. And doing this when you're not even sure if they made a mistake is the wrong thing to do. How should you proceed? Present the data to the parents and ask, why are you unhappy? A simple parent meeting before taking any more drastic steps. Watsonian behaviorism is also referred to as what? Remember, John Watson is the essentially the father of behaviorism. He dealt in methodological behaviorism, also known as SR psychology. And why was it known as SR psychology? Well, he didn't deal in consequences. He dealt with stimular, stimulus, stimulus, stimulus response relationships. So Watsonian's behavior, Watsonian behaviorism is also referred to as SR psychology and methodological behaviorism. Just a little fluency. Check. That's all. 90. You are designing attack training procedure that involves transferring control from a man to attack. What must you fade out in order to successfully complete the transfer of control? When we're thinking about operant training and especially transferring control from one operant to another, you've already always got to consider the start and where you're starting. What is the first operant you're starting with? What are you transferring to? Because that first operant you're starting with, a lot of times you're going to have to fade out those properties to get to the other operant. In this case, we're going from a manned to a tacked. Now, both are typically evoked by nonverbal stimuli. Mans are truly evoked by MOs, right? But a lot of times things in the environment can also evoke them, right? We can have you know, impure attacks. But if we want to con transfer control from a man to a tacked, what must we fade out? Well, to create a tact, we must fade out everything that a tact doesn't have. So is an MO, is a tact evoked by an MO? It's not. So we must fade out the MO. Is a tact evoked by an echoic labeling the item? It's not. You must fade that out as well. And is a tact evoked by what is that? It's not. Got to fade that out as well. So hopefully you see that pattern. In order to successfully make a new operant, you've got to fade out everything that isn't associated with the operant. If we're trying to create an intraverbal, we can't have point-to-point -point correspondence, right? Can't have it because it's not part of, part of an intraverbal. So that is the idea when we're fading or transferring control from one operant to another. Fade out what doesn't belong in the new operant. BehavioranalystStudy.com. All study materials, please subscribe for all of our updates. As always, work hard, study hard, and we will see you soon.